Kia ora everybody, um, I'm Debbie, I'm the team coordinator for Plunkett Before School Checks in Auckland and Waitemata and I've got the great pleasure of introducing you to Barbara, Dr Barbara Batchel who is, has a wealth of knowledge about children and she's going to introduce herself and tell you a little bit about her background. Thanks Barbara. Yeah, kia ora koutou katoa. Um, I'm Barbara Batchel and um, at the moment I work for Best Start but have um, over 40 years experience now in early childhood education and, and I've loved every moment and uh, I've worked I started as a kindergarten teacher I've worked in early childhood I've worked as a lecturer at the University of Auckland um, and I'm a knowledge nut so I've continued learning and wanting to know more about what I've been doing so in that journey has led me to to gaining a doctorate in early childhood education. Oh, thank you, Barbara. It's, it's a pleasure to be able to talk with you and to share that knowledge with you. It's fantastic. Um, so today we're going to talk a bit about play, especially with our four-year-olds. Um, do you want to tell me a little bit about uh, the large motor skills and the small motor skills that come in with play? Sure. Um, at four, year, four years of age, most children are learning through uh, physical play and they're learning through their large muscle um, activities like jumping and running and climbing. And they're also learning about their fine motor skills. They're starting to develop, um, you know, the pincer grip and being able to um, put on their own clothes and manage um uh, to pour water into a cup, all sorts of things like that. And their play just mimics the things that they really want to learn about, I think, Debbie. And mm -hmm. um, in that learning, the thing I'd really like to say today that I've learned is that that physicality and learning through doing um, means that children can learn learn all through that medium. So they learn about their emotions, they learn about self-control of their bodies, they learn about social interactions, they learn too um, about intellectual things like maths concepts from big and small and over and under. And um, mm -hmm. so really that, that physical play is so important for um, four-year-olds. Wow, that's amazing. Um, is there any one type of play you can think of that just covers everything that's, that's amazing? Is there anything you recommend that we, we get our four-year-olds doing? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> it's a lovely <laughs> question. Um, I, think it, I think it's not just one thing, though. I think it's a good variety of activities. I think it's getting into new experiences mm -hmm. and um, learning about, coping with that I think it's um, definitely around like obstacle courses and walks in the bush and uh, getting in touch with nature and getting in touch with using balance with their bodies and mm -hmm. it's as they do that that the, that children are really learning um, all sorts of concepts about their environment I also think um, blocks are a brilliant play source for children. And mm -hmm. I think that because it allows them to use their imagination and it also allows them to enter when they're ready, cooperative play. So the physical play of building something also becomes something where children are using their thinking skills and their problem solving skills to work together and they're so learning social skills about how they can um, cooperate with each other to make something happen. And the trial and error of that, because that's an important part of learning, is, is that I don't relate the same with every, every four-year-old I meet. And what mm -hmm. will that mean? What will I do differently? Um, it's all almost, it is, it's subconscious learning. So they're not intentionally learning social skills. They're not intentionally learning about the mathematics of structure and how to put things together. But that their play brings them to that space. And it's as 
we as adults add language to that, that we we allow them to enter into those communities like mathematics, like everyday knowledge for shopping, um, like the science of balance or push and pull and force. It's as mm -hmm. we add those words that we are giving some idea of that concept and that's how children build their language as well. Oh, wow, that's huge, isn't it? It is, yeah. As parents, how do we encourage our children to engage in that imaginative play? Oh, that's a great question, because I think imaginative play really comes to its fore with, mm -hmm. with, um, this, with this age group. And um, I think it's just having props and having pieces of things that children can make or pretend as something else. Sticks mm -hmm. and pieces of material or their favourite um, toys, whether they're soft toys or dolls or whatever, whether they're blocks or uh, whatever they've got, um, brings them to a point where they want to create what's happening in their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. And if, if you think about as a parent what you do every day with your children, it's often those things that they want to mimic. And mm -hmm. so it's like having kitchen um, bowls and cups and plates and spoons that they can pretend to be cooking dinner. Or it's, um, you know, maybe it's using a stick to pretend they're mowing the lawn when dad's mowing or after dad's mowed would probably be safer. <laughs> um, um, it's that kind of thing. I remember once coming in on my son uh, when he was about this age and he had got one of his sister's dolls and was... Um, uh, found a spoon in a bowl and he was pretending to feed the doll and I thought oh he's mimicking that I I feed Sarah like that you know like there's all these connections because what they say about um, that family play or dramatic play or, or, or whatever is that um, it helps children make meaning of what's happening in their lives you know when the rugby was on uh, mm -hmm. when the World Cup was here. Now, that's a while ago now, but when it was here, in many of our centres, we saw children doing the haka everywhere because it was mm -hmm. a socialised ritual that we were that they were seeing some importance mm -hmm. with, with the adults that they were associating with. So that dramatic play is playing out the things that are really important um, for the, ch for the children and what they're seeing in, in their community and in their families, really. I can remember doing the dishes and my, ch my children, when they're about this age, always loved to have a bowl of soapy water and, and some yes. dishes to wash and dry themselves. So it was, it's, it gets them doing some things around the house, but it teaches them a lot and, and they just enjoy doing it as well. That's right. That's right. And that's the time you want to, t want to encourage it because it encourages it to grow absolutely um, rather than having to enforce it <laughs> yes that comes later <laughs> yeah um, we've got a question from a parent she says my she or he says my four-year-old boy is struggling with some big feelings at present including reduced attention from mum and dad after getting a baby brother a few months ago how can we help him learn to articulate and regulate his emotions particularly anger sadness and jealousy through play lovely question mm -hmm. and Beautiful. and a very common situation um, that people that parents find themselves in I, I think one of the first things is to actually acknowledge those feelings maybe a doll as well boy or girl it, it doesn't matter you see I talked about my son um, playing with that doll and he was acting out what I was doing with his little sister and by the way he was a similar child to the one being described mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think it's acknowledging those feelings it's, it's giving time to play with him when you can. And um, it's also giving him opportunity to um, interact, if he's willing, uh, with, with the new baby. Um, I also think that um, physical activity helps. Running, going on a long walk, um, knowing that he can use physical activity that he enjoys, whether it's throwing a ball, um, that he can use it 
to um, to release some of the tension and emotion he's feeling. Um, I think that that's an excellent thing if, if you're able to do that. But I, th but I do think, and what research says is it's really important to acknowledge those feelings and talk about ways that he can express those in safe ways. Another way that's common is to scribble out your anger. So have a crown and a bit of paper and just go for it. Um, whatever, it will be different for different children. But those are the two that I find most effective, either scribbling out your feelings or actually doing something really physical that actually releases the endorphins to make you actually feel a bit better and that you learn to use that as a self-regulation tool for your life, really, for your moments. If you think about it as us as adults, if we need a timeout moment, often going for a walk is a way that we can do that. Yeah. Absolutely. I know we talk to a lot of parents when there's a new sibling about one-on-one -on -one yeah. time. If you can find that time, they, they so appreciate a bit of one-on-one -on -one time. And we're talking a lot these days about acknowledging those feelings and giving yeah, a name to the feelings so they, yeah. that they know what's happening and, and giving them an outlet, as Barbara's talked about. That's amazing information. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah. A good feel. As you talk, Debbie, I was just thinking a good book on feelings is really useful and there's a number of them in the shops now or in the libraries that that people could get that talk even stories about um having a new baby brother or sister um and talk through some of those feelings or just that what do i do when i'm angry what do i do when mm -hmm. so there's a lot more books around to support children of this age with them um, if that's a medium because it's really it's about with play, it's about finding the medium that children feel most comfortable um, being involved in and engaging with. And that, that changes from month to month. But um, it's also related to personality. So it's what, what the child enjoys, whether it's the walk, the physicality, the drawing, or reading and talking about emotions, really, or a combination, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, so some of the fine motor skills that I know we, we need as we get older for writing and things like that, how can we start building those up through play? I think it's through, through doing finer um, motor school activities, like mm -hmm. doing a jigsaw puzzle, like um, holding a crown or a piece of chalk or using a paintbrush. So you're making a mark for the first time and you're learning that marks can have meaning for you. And learning that marks have meaning is actually the beginning of, of thinking about um, that that letters are a meaning-making tool. So right at the beginning, it's probably more like three, there's the beginning of starting to see that you can make a mark and then making those marks make meaning to you. So they might not like, look like anything else to anyone else, but, that, but to the child, uh, especially when they can talk and tell you, I've had some amazing discussions about lines and circles on a piece of paper and what they actually represent. Um, mm -hmm. So they can get quite complex, but it's actually that fine motor school, anything that's using that pincher grip or mm -hmm. um, anything that's using the fingers to, to, to really practice. So sometimes in the summer or um, in the warmer weather, it can be about um, having a jug and and water and children often like pouring things from one container to another. Mm -hmm. And that too allows them to look at the finer skill and also mm -hmm. um, allows them to look. A, something that's really part of that is the ha what we call the hand-eye coordination. So mm -hmm. it's about what you watch and where you direct your fine skill is uh, what you want to actually do. So you can't uh, put a piece of puzzle in a place or put a peg on a board without actually looking to do it. So those peg boards and the stacking games are also ways that they can um, learn to use fine motor skill for a purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I was just thinking about when you were talking about the making a mark and an example somebody or an idea someone gave me once that my kids loved was a squeezy bottle with water in on a hot day writing with the squeezy bottle of water on the ground doesn't make a mess it cleans up and the kids have a ball and they're learning about those skills it's great yeah and you've just reminded me of one I used to do when I was teaching and that's using the squeezy bottles mm -hmm. um, and I love that you use that word too <laughs> um, and often the baby bar baby bath and baby oil bottles or something smaller works better in their hands and um, bigger than a ping pong ball so it's not dangerous and they put it in their mouths but you can sort of from the two dollar shops you can get the almost like the um, about a tennis ball size that are really light and you can push them across the you can use a squeezy bottle to push the the ball across the floor and um if you're inclined, I then used to talk about air pressure, but that's <laughs> that's if that knowledge is important for the for the family, whether you talk about that or not. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, yes, that's a lovely way of doing that, and those but fine and all skills as well sort of help with those um, fine skills, don't they? Absolutely, yeah. Um, just as parents, how much should we guide our children's play? Ah, now that's a that's the million dollar question, um, and there's different views on that. Mm -hmm. But um, the New Zealand early childhood curriculum that we use to Fariki often talks about child centred play. So what we're looking for is children to lead it or parents to introduce the play and then see how the child works with that play, so that. Um, I think it's very hard for, for young children to know what we're wanting in our thinking in terms of interpreting their play. Mm -hmm. And so if we try to lead it and control it, I think young children haven't got the experience to know how to interact with that. So play for four-year-olds is really about them learning about their environment and um, so it's about how they want to play with it. S parents seeing how that's happening and entering into that play. There's some lovely ads. I think there's an insurance ad where they're dinosaurs and things and the dad and the daughter run around the house. It's that kind of thing. And it's like, um, it's like when Frozen was a big thing, the movie Frozen, um, lots of girls wanted to be. Um, that princess and do that kind of thing. And so it's allowing that kind of expression to ha happen. I think when the play becomes more directed, though, Debbie, could be when um, when you get into teaching games uh, guess, yeah. that have rules, which is good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And if children want to play those games and if children want to change those rules to the games that's mm -hmm. good because they're using their thinking skills to develop and make changes innovations really so they're yeah. learning to make choices so the games are kind of like uh maybe games that you've had or or parents have had in their in their childhood you know like hide and seek uh what's the time mr wolfie where um, someone stands and, and uh, has their back to you and you creep up saying that until they say it's dinner time and then everyone runs away. So there's excitement within that, but there's rules. There's nice circle games where they um, can pass balls to each other. Um, mm -hmm. That's really lovely. That's lovely when you see two children sitting down together pushing a ball between each other. There's a really there's a real sense, growing sense then of, of a knowing of of the other person really so any games i think um and starting to look at very easy board games mm -hmm. um, that all of those do need a little bit of intervention from a, a parent to kind of teach the rules like teaching how to play snap yeah um, the card game if, if parents know that so mainly it's about allowing, giving opportunity for children to play and explore how they want, mm -hmm. giving direction when needed for safety, and then looking at times when you might have um, games where there's rules, where you start to enjoy those as a family. Mm -hmm. um, 
and those do need a bit more attention yeah I know one of the board games my children liked at about this age was um, Candyland because oh, you didn't yeah. have the dice that you had to know numbers for. It uses the cards. And I know that was one they really loved us playing with them. So mm. I see what you're saying about getting those, learning the rules and learning how to make things work. Yeah. Yeah. I had a question and it's just gone out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I heard something recently just on a different path, but um, with colouring. Now, a lot of children I know really like colouring, but I had a discussion with somebody who was very, didn't like colouring books. It was blank paper and the children to guide themselves in their drawing. Is there much thought about this um, in the theory, field of theory? Yeah, a, a lot of thought about that. And I think whether whether a child has a colouring in book or not is actually up to the parent. And you could mm -hmm. say it helps them to learn some fine motor school stuff. But for visual arts um, in early childhood and the research that's gone into that is mm -hmm. saying to us that the piece of paper and children learning to draw paint uh, whatever them by themselves brings about a greater level of thinking and creativity and um, and expression you in early childhood you'll often hear that um, art is a child's language and while they can't speak they express emotions they express concepts through their art and I think that in an early childhood centre you would I would hope not to see a colouring in book I would hope to see a representation of a wide range of arts like collage painting drawing pencil and crayon um, that children can learn about shading can learn about different size brushes and and the strokes they make and actually start to mix the different mediums because all of that is creating uh, possibilities within their minds so it's actually allowing them to think deeper about mm -hmm. what they're doing than when they're coloring in a picture but as I've said I think there's no harm in that for some time but mm -hmm. as a as a purist my children never had them <laughs> <laughs> It's just something I hadn't heard before and I was quite fascinated. Yeah. And I, can yeah. see, I can see the reasons for it. It was just, um, I'd never heard it before. Isn't that interesting? No, no. And I had colouring books. I had hundreds of colouring books mm -hmm. as a child. And it's only because I learnt that through my study that yeah. I, I changed that practice for me. But that's why I say I don't think it matters. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it matters if children have a few colouring in books, but they also need opportunity just to draw by themselves. Because I think also the drawing is more a precursor to writing than colouring in is, because they're learning to control the mark, to make a shape, um, and then later to make a letter. So yeah. even from that perspective, not the creative and the thinking skills that are associated with the visual arts, but, but even for letter writing later, um, it's better for them to be free drawing. Excellent. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So if our children are drawing amazing pieces of art, how do we go about asking them about their, their work and do, do we ask them about it or do we just take it as it is or do we? Oh, absolutely it? ask. Absolutely mm -hmm. ask. And there's some lovely questions you can use. I mean, you can just say, would you like to tell me about your art? And I've started a conversation with a child even this year like that and ended up seeing a whole lot of marks being mummy and daddy and auntie and this person and that one. And this is the picnic area and this is that didn't look like that at all to me. But the discussion <laughs> that came yeah. from that was so, so rich. There's also, from, an, from a visual arts perspective, you can talk about, it's interesting how you chose that colour. Mm -hmm. What does that colour mean to you? Or is that, is that person far away or are they close? So you start to talk about the aspects within the picture and you start to, I, 
talk about how that art is developing over time. You know, like mm -hmm. there's some really good um, diagrams that illustrate how children develop their art and how that often it's a circle for a person's head with mm -hmm. eyes, nose and, and a mouth and then the legs and arms come off of that. And then later on they start putting in the body. But yep. you see it's their perception. It's mm -hmm. not that it's right or it's not that it's wrong. It's because mm -hmm. they're often looking up at us and all they see is our faces and then they see our legs. They're not actually taking in um, our whole body and what it looks like. Um, and so art for children is often their perception of what they're seeing. And so it can be very different from what we're expecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we see it a lot with our four-year-olds when we do the before school checks. That yeah. We often ask them to draw us a picture and we ask them to draw a person just because it gives us a lot of information. But some children won't. We have children that will choose to draw a car or a dinosaur or something. It still gives us information that's yeah. interesting. We have children who absolutely will not draw, which once again is their choice. Um, just, It's just interesting. Um, and puzzles. Something my children were always loved at this age. They're good for developing skills? Oh, absolutely. A whole lot of different skills. Um, problem solving, math skills, learning about shape, learning um, differentiating um, and looking at colour or shape because mm -hmm. children will have often have a preference. They'll, they'll complete a puzzle related to how the colours fit together or they'll... Mm -hmm. Um, have a preference to look at shapes and build from that. Now, both are good, but sometimes you need one or the other. So it's actually um, suggesting another problem-solving skill if something isn't quite working. And it's also scaffolding, I find, which is a word we often use in um, education, which just means helping, helping the learner with the piece they need to see next. So if a puzzle's too hard, I put two or three pieces in and say, can you see where the next one goes? Because it would have been impossible for that child to be able to, to put those ones in. But also it depends on the pictures that they can be learning about. Um, there's lovely puzzles like that are three layered that talk about the cycle of the monarch butterfly. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all sorts of teaching that comes part of that. A fun thing to do as a parent, because it's easier to do now, is to, um, to find favorite pictures of things that children like and take a photo of that and then make, um, print it out, put it on card, harder cardboard and cut it out and have a, um, a jigsaw puzzle on something that they really enjoy. It doesn't matter how you cut it, as long as it's the number of pieces that corresponds to where they're at with jigsaw puzzle making. They go through puzzles quite quickly. So one of the suggestions I made on the last video, and um, I, I did say I wasn't sure how many were around, but toy libraries are lovely. We were driving in the country back from Rotorua the other week, um, and we went through a small town and there was a huge sign that said toy library. And I thought, ah, there are some. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's worth Googling because then you could um, just get a few puzzles, try them out, see what they're like. Um, and if there was a favourite, favourite, then maybe mm -hmm. for a birthday you'd buy that. But buying lots of puzzles would be really quite expensive for a family, I would imagine. Yeah. I think some libraries hire out puzzles for young children ah, as well. Yeah. yeah. That's oh, that nice. would be worth people checking out, Debbie. That's Yeah, I didn't know that. I must check that out, actually. Mm -hmm. um, it's good to know to pass on to people and to pass on to centres and families and the early childhood centres where I work. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I lost it again. Sorry, I'm getting all these questions and then they, <laughs> I get so excited <laughs> about talking about and I forget where I was going to go with that one, the next one. Oh, children have different levels of play as they get older, so they sort of, play alongside each other when did they start doing that cooperative play where they the give and take that where they where they actually talk to each other about what they're doing when does that really kick in I think we, I think when their language develops and so language development is different for different children but it is around three and definitely by four four you're expecting that cooperative play 
to begin to happen and what what we call more complex play where the uh, before uh, a child might have just played with one toy and enjoyed that playing with it or passed a ball backwards and forward the more complex play is when they're joining more um variety of things together like um, in an early childhood center where you might have a family corner and they've got um, the doll at the table and they're feeding the doll and then they're taking the doll to the bed and putting it down to sleep and then they take the doll in a pram and they go for a walk outside and at that point a do uh, definitely a block becomes a telephone a mobile telephone <laughs> Mm -hmm. anything becomes a mobile telephone within that yeah. dramatic play because they see us all using them um, mm -hmm. all the time. So, I, yeah, it's it's any time from about three to three and a half, depending on their language development, because it's that communication with each other that makes it so important to be able to share ideas. That's the big thing is to mm -hmm. share ideas so that you can then work together on something. Some children tend to do that slightly intuitively through body language because we must never and underestimate how children use body language, but mm -hmm. usually it's around when the, when the language comes. Yeah. That's something I, I, I thought it was around then, but yeah, I thought that was just an interesting question. Um, I've got another question from a, someone here saying should we worry when our four-year-olds are finding sharing difficult no don't worry but what we do is we look for opportunities to model what what sharing might look like and i think the sharing is more about taking turns um, than taking something off somebody and learning about the emotion of frustration the one for us that's similar for adults would be, you know, standing in a long line at a supermarket that we've all had to get used to over this last couple mm -hmm. of years and how frustrating we find that. But a child doesn't know how to manage those emotions. And we talked about that earlier. And so it's actually a combination of learning to cope with those emotions and learning self-regulation to wait. And that's mm -hmm. not easy, but the people have success when they sh talk about that emotion and what it means to them. And I can remember doing this with a child just two years ago when I, when I crouched down beside him and just said, you know, it's really hard having to wait. Don't you find that? And he nodded and I said, I find waiting hard, but we have to do it sometimes to get what we want. All of us have to wait. Do you think you could wait just a few more minutes with me? Would that make it easier? And so it's like you're coaching your own child um, mm -hmm. through that process of learning how to cope with that. Um, and it is absolutely normal for a four-year-old not to want to do to share or to yeah. wait for something because sharing is often that if I have to share, I have to wait or I have to have my turn and I have to be prepared to pass it over for someone else to have a turn. Um, and I would say that in some situations, it's too big a expectation of children Mm -hmm. of this age Absolutely. and that it's better to have um, enough of something but at other times it's it's a reality and what we have to do is allow our children to learn how to cope with those negative emotions because they're going mm -hmm. they're going to have them and it's so much better the Dunedin study in um, longitudinal study has really shown us that it is so much better if they can learn those self-regulation skills um, mm -hmm. when they're young. But um, four to six, I would say, I mean, some children, because of their personality, just naturally don't have the same struggle. And they're mm -hmm. fortunate. Uh, yeah. You don't choose your personality. And you have to learn sometimes if you're a bubbly person, a vivacious person, an emotional person, you, you have to learn about how to work with that within society. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what two to, to eight-year-olds are doing. It's yeah. big stuff for a little person to it learn, is, isn't it? It is, a, it is big stuff. 
I always say, and I say to teachers, please remember not to expect more from a child than you'd expect for you, from yourself. And it really helped me when my children were young. I'd go, is this a reasonable expectation? Expectation, yeah. Barbara, or are you just feeling it today and just need to walk away for five minutes? Because it's much harder, can I tell you, people, it's much harder being a parent than it is to be a teacher. The emotions yes. that are involved are much stronger. So um, it's a. I think parenting is the most important job in the world, really. It it's creates really the next generation of citizens. It's mm -hmm. really important work. Yeah. And we know it's not easy. No. But sometimes it's just wonderful and it's those moments that make it worth doing. Absolutely. I know we often talk about sharing because we get this question a lot at the before school check. And we talk about sharing being this big concept that's too big for little little people to absolutely understand. So we talk yeah. a lot about taking turns that you talked about earlier, sort of saying it's more about taking turns. So it's whatever they were doing, it's not actually being taken away from them. They actually have a chance to come back to it as well. Um, and I also often say is how I know a lot of adults that don't know how to share. So how do mm. we expect year olds to have it down pat? Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. that, that coaching, question. that coaching really, really is the best way. Yeah. And also, I, I guess Debbie would be remembering that it doesn't happen the first time. You yeah. know, if we've got if we've got a habit or if we've got a way of thinking, you think as adults, and we know it's something we should change. Mm -hmm. um, it, we can't do it as soon as we know we need to change it. It, it takes time. So also um, don't feel guilty if it's not happening once, twice, three, four, five, ten times, but just be consistent with mm -hmm. that approach, I think. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, playgrounds. The you know, they're, they're obviously good for kids to be running around and playing. What what sort of playground, you know, our little four-year-olds, they're, they're okay on the great big playgrounds or are we looking for smaller ones? You know, I know there's lots around. When do we worry they, about them from a safety perspective, I think, as well as the play? They've really changed, haven't they? Mm -hmm. That's the big thing. And now I think um, councils have a real eye on safety and we've actually mm -hmm. just been through some training with um, the Best Start Teachers on safety and playgrounds and thinking about those very things. I think height is an issue and we mm -hmm. need to look at height with young children. It's an, it's an interesting conundrum because it's about allowing enough risk for them to continue learning and learning to manage risk, but mm -hmm. not having a risk that's too great that they end up with a serious injury, yeah. you know, like a broken arm or something. But most playgrounds have good, I'd look for good safety surfaces mm -hmm. and I would look for um, um, equipment that they can easily get on and off of mm -hmm. so that um, so that it's not um, a challenge to get down off something once they've got up there. I think that that is the um, that's the important thing, but I, I think swings are wonderful things mm -hmm. uh, for children, and I think it, it supports them emotionally, but physically, and for me because one of my backgrounds is as an early childhood and primary science lecturer, so for mm -hmm. me the whole idea of talking through and I heard a teacher once beautifully did better than I could ever do talking through the push and pull and the forces and what was happening while a child was having a swing and it was just just wonderful just mm -hmm. wonderful yeah I'm just wishing I'd known these things when my children were little <laughs> <laughs> we but just I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> me, well yeah me too in the beginning until until I had further further knowledge but I think for parents, it's it's actually choosing the knowledges that you think are important to you because there are so many. There's cultural knowledges, there's ethnic knowledges, there's knowledge about sport, about um, uh, uh, entertainment and history and science and maths and, mm -hmm. and so it goes on. And so I don't think we need to get overstimulating with our children but to actually think what do we enjoy that our children could enjoy and how could they learn more about that and by our language we introduce them into those communities 
Um, mm -hmm. And I think maths is one that, and literacy is one that comes very naturally because it's a part of our own lives um, to, to live with. And so that works quite well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, it's, sorry, I'm just been a long day and my brain's sort of a little bit <laughs> fried I'm just, I had something else I wanted to ask I'm just really enjoying picking your brain on this because there's just so much amazing knowledge out there um oh, oh boredom that, yes that children being bored and believing it's a good thing do you want to talk a little bit about that yes that that's a that's a great question Debbie and I think um that boredom often comes when we um, can, when we organise a lot of their time, and what the research is saying is it's because they don't know how to use time themselves, and mm -hmm. um, so it is good to have slow times where children actually choose and that's part of what I was talking about before in terms of children leading the play. Yeah. Um, and having materials, and it doesn't have to be expensive materials. It can be um, a walk in the bush. It can, which slow often slows people's um, thinking and metabolism and um, whole being down, so that they're um, engaging and more peaceful. Um, but it, it can be simply having a whole lot of pegs that they can make something with. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think there's a problem with momentary boredom, but mm -hmm. it's how a child learns how to create um, create non-boredom for themselves through doing different things. I remember once a child saying to me, that we were going to I said we were going to go somewhere and we were going to it was going to be a fun time so mm -hmm. she got there and she said to me so where's the fun and I said well, we have to make it you know it's <laughs> that, um it doesn't just appear <laughs> it's what we do that makes it fun and so it's how do we because that's it really for me the opposite of boredom is engagement and fun yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's actually how do they learn to make that if we organise all that we all the time in their day and what they're doing? I think we there has to be structure. Don't don't um, hear me wrong. There needs to be structure in the day, and there needs to be boundaries and routines. Mm -hmm. But there needs to be time where a child chooses, because that's part of learning about independence and choosing when and what they'll be involved in um, that's as they get older. Yeah, that's awesome. So, I mean, thank you so much for all this fabulous information. It's just been amazing. I've just loved hearing all this. And it's just, you know, things about giving a name to those feelings and um, looking at that physical play being so important because it just covers so much of the of what they're going to be doing later in life. It's just building those skills from it from this mm. level. Um, and I love that little bit about learning how to wait and and taking turns. That was yeah. just so thank you so much for your time Barbara it's been very much appreciated um, and I'm sure we're all going away with wonderful ideas of what we can do with our kids and our grandkids and and children that we meet out there and spend time with thank, thank you very you. much